so today we'll be discussing the lex uh, the next uh, lecture lecture 5 in cs 224 so this as the title says uh, the lecture is mainly and totally about dependency parsing and uh, sentence structure we'll see what that is so we are all that components uh, languages or or sentence so so they, they also call the starting units. So basically, whenever we are trying to express something or communicate something, we start we use words and we use collection of words to to make up uh, a sentence and express whatever we want to communicate. So words are the building blocks or the starting units of uh, language for, that we use for communication. And then uh, when we put a few words together, it it forms uh, a phrase. So phrase is nothing but a collection of words. So um, a single word and a sentence, and words can combine together to form bigger phrases. So these are like the building blocks of uh, of the sentences that we use for communication. So what we see, what we see here is some sort of uh, parts of speech tagging for every word in the sentence. And uh, we we have to do that because uh, understanding the structure of the sentence is very important part of natural language understanding. So this is called a phrase structure. And as we can see here, uh, every word here is given uh, a, a certain category label. Like uh, we can see here, the word the is a determinant, is a noun, an adjective. You must be familiar with uh, the, par the parts of speech. And these are all nothing but each word being given a tag, uh, depending on what part of speech it belongs to. And then uh, that's for uh, the word level. And when it comes to phrases, we have uh, these certain categories called NP, PP, prepositional phrases, phrases and all these things, which, which is some sort of uh, a category or representation for certain kinds of configuration, like NP stands for a phrase which which is of this configuration, uh, determinant, adjective, noun. That's what we see here, the curly cat. The is a determinant, curly is an adjective, and cat is a noun. So this together forms uh, a specific phrase category called NP. And similarly, we have another example here by the door, uh, which is called a uh, prepositional phrase. And uh, it, this again, it, one thing is, that we notice here is that did we? Uh... I think we lost you. Can you all uh, see the slides now? And the slides are there. The connection is a little choppy. Uh, is it still bad or is it okay enough? It seems okay. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so here we have uh, different categories for phrases as well, just like we have for words. And what we see here on the left is the curly cat is an example for a phrase category called NP, which is nothing but a configuration that, that comes with this sort of uh, uh, parts of speech series called. Uh, we have the curly cat here, the example phrase, and the first word in it uh, is a determinant, and then we have an adjective, and then we have a noun. 
So similarly, we have another uh, phrase category called PP by the door. And uh, if you notice something here, uh, that that contains another nested uh, phrase category NP. So this is also possible where you have uh, phrase categories in which we have nested components. And that's what we see here. We, we, we see some sort of recursive uh, combination of uh, phrase categories the curly cat by the door so this is how uh, we are this is how we are using uh, one or two phrases we are putting them together to form uh, another sentence the curly cat by the door it's not complete but i think it conveys something uh, it conveys more information than each of these phrases do individually so, uh, so these slides, if you're wondering, uh, these are the same CS224 co course. So uh, the slides are available in two forms. One is uh, where you don't have all these uh, scribblings uh, and th th these are the slides with, with, with the scribblings that are shown during the lecture. So you can find them from the course page itself. Uh, so as you see here, we have one group of words here, the and a, and we have another group of words here, cat and dog. And uh, so the way, uh, in order to make things easier and proper communication of, uh, for proper communication, we have, uh, la every language has its own classes, its own uh, syntax. So here we have a certain class of words called determinants, the and a, and similarly we have another class of words here called nouns. So likewise, we have other different classes. So what, what's happening here is if we see, these are all some examples of how uh, different words can be put together to form uh, different, uh, different configuration of sentences. So here what we can do is, uh, we can say the large cat in a crate. That's one example that we can form using these words. And then we can say the barking dog uh, by the door. So depending on how we put these things together, we, we are going to get different sort of sentences, different kinds of sentences. And accordingly, their uh, word and phrase Both voice and screen gone. Ah, uh, sorry again. Okay, so as I was saying, these are some of the examples. Um, so moving on, so what, what's happening here is we have, have a sentence and uh, each word in it has some sort of uh, category that gets assigned. And that somehow conveys how in the sentence is dependent on any other group of words. So we can see that look in the large crate in the kitchen by the door considering we are taking look as the root and then we are forming here which convey which word is dependent on which words so we here we are saying that look is a word that that's saying so, so that is somehow dependent in on these group of words in the large grid look so we say look so where, where exactly do we have to look so the next series of words convey the, convey, convey the answer which is in the large crate. And in, in the kitchen is also dependent on that. So this is one example. So wh why do we need this sort of uh, sentence structuring and uh, word or phrase categories? So one of the reasons is that we need to understand those sentence structures so that uh, natural language understanding is possible. So we, uh, we humans widely and always all the time use language to communicate and uh, speak with other people and intuitively parse the meaning of the syntactic meaning of this spoken by the people around us. So that, that's something which comes naturally for 
even uh, sentences but when it comes to machine that easy even sentences which are very trivial for us to understand for the machines uh, to understand so that is why we need sentence structuring which will help the machines to better understand and actually understand the sentences in the way that they have to be understood we when we are communicating with someone we express a lot of things it could be something about uh, something that you did in the morning it could be as simple as that or it could be something that you have that you have been working on or complex idea that you have invented or some it, it could be as big as that so making machines understand all these all these different levels of uh, communication or language is not that easy so here is one example so sanjo's cops kill man with knife so we we were talking about uh, what each of these word is like uh, okay we have word here which is noun we have a word here which is a verb so why do we really have to need that now let's say when this sort of sentence is given to the system and we don't have sentence structuring in place or uh, or, or a proper part this sentence could be interpreted in many different ways one way to think about this is sanjo's cops kill man with knife so one right way to think about the sentence is that there is a man who was uh, who is thief and that person that uh, that that person was killed sanjo's cops that's one way of interpreting it and then there is another way sanjo's cops kill man and they did that using a knife so interpretation of the same sentence so we can see that there is uh, a level here even with a sentence which is as simple as this now think about sentences which are more complex which have more words and that brings in a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities so which is why we need some sort of parser or structure uh, some sort of parser in place which will help the machines to better understand the sentences so that they will be able to Uh, get the right results so this is one example and uh, we have another example here scientists count whales from space so this again depends on how how you read the sentence so we uh, we, we will be easily able to say that uh, the intention of the sentence is that from space we are count the number of whales using some sort of technology that's one way of thinking about it but uh, there is another way where we can say count whales from space which means these whales are present in space but not in sea or ocean which conveys a totally different meaning so this this is just another example to convey how ambiguity can can be a problem when sentences or human languages here is another example what we have here is the board approved its by royal tusco limited of toronto for 27 dollar at its monthly meeting so as we can see here this is a uh, a pretty long sentence when compared uh, to the previous ones that we have seen so what we have here is we have different combination of phrases and we have we have almost four prepositional phrases all of these by royal tusco limited of toronto for 27 dollars a share at its monthly meeting each of these is a prepositional phrase and now uh, depending on which verb or which noun it associates or depends on the meaning is going to change so this is one example so now let's say that we have a parser in place and it is trying to figure out which is of structuring this sentence or parsing this sentence if if that parser the algorithm or the parser is not optimal we are looking at a problem which is of exponential and we know that that is not good anything exponential is not something which which is much better so he again so shuttle veteran and long time nasa executive fronted to board so depending on how we did it even for us Made it. The sentence meaning is going to change. Here, 
the shuttle veteran the executive can be can be one person the same person who is fred gregory and uh, who who is appointed to the board and it can also be interpreted uh, that we have two persons here one is shuttle veteran and uh, another one is a long term nasa executive fred gregory and they were appointed to board so this is another example so we have a few other examples like this to uh, to explain or to show how the sentences can be ambiguous this is another example and we have another example here so and this again uh, so these are just multiple examples to convey how ambiguity can be very very tricky for natural language understanding this just to, if you haven't gone through the lecture or the slides the mutilated body washes up on rio beach to be used for beach volleyball so now to be used for olympics beach volleyball referring to it is referring to on rio beach uh, right but the way one reads it or the way one understands it it could also convey that body is being used for the olympics beach volleyball which is which is not the right right way of interpreting this sentence so all of these examples prove structuring and uh, parsing is very important natural language understanding so this of uh, uh, this is the structure of uh, the the dependency or the semantic relations as we can see here there is some sort of tree structure here the example is that uh, the results demonstrated uh, that kai uh, so we this 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 is another example uh, where we 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 see the tree structure here so the results demonstrated interacts uh, i hope i'm reading this right interacts that chi c rhythmically uh, yeah so the results demonstrated that chi c interacts rhythmically with uh, sas a chi a and chi b so this got something to do with protein interaction so this is just an example um so this is how the dependency tree is constructed now we can see here that this is just one possibility now depending on what parser you use and how that parser inter works for the game for the same sentence we might have many other possible dependency trees as well which means some sort of selection or choosing that has to happen like they they could creation of the different dependency trees for the same sentence and the parser has to make sure that it picks the right one or the one with the highest concord so here is a little bit of about uh, dependency grammar it goes back to quite time back 1962 and even in 5th century where uh, panini has uh, done some work on this for uh, the sanskrit language and uh, we have several other uh, examples here the works of some of the people like chomsky so there are different ways uh, of representing this some people uh, it, like the way the arrows are represented so this is just an example for that so just like we have annotated data for uh, images or for uh, other other kinds of data even for this we need some sort of annotated and annotated data only then we can have some sort of model that can be trained on that which can do the dependency uh, which can do the parsing for uh, for the new data so this is example of uh, such annotated data that uses so why tree banks we will see that uh, we'll see that so so initially when you are getting started tree bank it seems to be a very so slow process but uh, with several advantages like let's say we the task is to have these kind of these kinds of dependent or different dependency trees and as language linguist 
artists do. They, they, each person might have different way of doing it, which, uh, which is not really that helpful. But what these three banks do is that they make, uh, they, they're reusable. Like if I'm a person who is working on something and I, uh, if there is already some work that is already done related uh, to those, uh, related to that language, I think that the, the previous work can be reused when it's in the form of tree banks. So it, it lets you build other parts of speech taggers using the existing uh, tree banks. So those are some of, these are some of uh, the advantages Um, so here we have uh, usually some constraints. Yeah, so this here we can see that the here we have an example sentence. I'll give a talk tomorrow, and we, uh, there is also some sort of overlapping or crisscrossing of some of some of the dependency plots. So the, the, though this is possible, it's not it's not that uh, that frequent. But what's important is that I don't really want cycles to be seen here. Like if you have uh, a dependent words, like let's say here we have the difference between the words uh, on bootstrapping, and you have you have the arrow from which goes like this, and then you don't want another same. To, from the same word to the same words in the reverse direction. So you don't want to have cycles. You should you should avoid the cycles in these kind of situations. So there are different ways of uh, doing dependency parsing. So as we have seen before, go, if we are simply going by all the all the all the possible configurations, we are going to have. Uh, Okay, uh, we're going to have an exponential, it's going to take exponentially, uh, exponential time, which is not good. So to avoid that, we can use uh, dynamic programming. So if you're even, so you must be aware of dynamic programming from the normal uh, algorithm, algorithmic approach, where you use uh, sub, the solutions to the sub problems or the reuse, uh, you, 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 reuse the solutions to the sub problems and build on top of that. You, you can use dynamic programming, you can graph algorithms. So, th so there are different ways to do it. The, in the lecture, these things are not discussed in detail, but rather at uh, the parsers that are being used at the moment, uh, when the parsers that Google uses to parse the web pages and websites method, transition-based parsing or deterministic dependency parsing. So here, here again is a little bit of history like uh, greedy transition-based parsing. Uh, in the lecture, it, we, it, it was not detailed. Rather, uh, we, in the lecture, we see that uh, they directly switch to this example as uh, it's believed that the example conveys, conveys it better. So what we have here is we have two things. One is a stack and a buffer. To initially start with buffer is nothing but the list of all the words that we have in our data or let's say in our sentence. Initially start, stack is simply going to have uh, a root element. And then we have, uh, so here we can see on the right side. So we have start where uh, the stack starts with root. And then we have a buffer, which is nothing but a list of all the words in our sentence. <clears throat> and then what we see here, one, two, three, are, this, are the possible actions that could be performed on uh, st uh, stack and buffer. And uh, we say that we are done when uh, the buffer is empty. So that's our finished state or the indicator that we are done. So here's one example. So what's happening here is that uh, initially we get started with this where root in our stack and we have the words in our sentence i ate the buffer so the the first action that is performed here is the operation so what shift does is it takes the first element in the buffer 
and that gets pushed to the stack. So that is why we see the word I moving from buffer to stack. So that's what happened. And then we have, uh, since this is the only word that we have, and in order to build dependency curves, we'll be needing more words. So we have another shift operation, which means another word from the buffer is being pushed into the stack. So we now have two words, which means we can do some sort of, uh, any of the other two uh, actions, which is left arc or right arc. And what's happening here is left arc operation is performed, which means you're saying that the word eight is, for the word eight, the subject is I. So this is one dependency that was figured out from this, from this state that we have here. So here left arc is performed. And then we, uh, once that is done, uh, we have another shift operation, which means we, we now have only fish in the buffer and we have uh, the word eight in stack. So again, uh, a similar, uh, we, have a, we have a right arc here, which means we have another dependency here. The word fish is dependent on eight. Like fish is the object of eight. So that's what this means, object eight. So then we have another right arc operation here. So you need, even if you're confused or if you haven't gone to the lecture, you may not get it uh, the first time you're going. So that's fine. The important thing to note here is that sentence here, and we somehow have, we somehow uh, need to do the dependency graph or uh, how these words are dependent among each. So for that, we see that we have a list of actions that are possible. So same things are uh, pretty good at identifying how these things are related to each other. Quickly able to use these operations and see how can be constructed. But now think about this from a machine perspective. We have these three actions here and the, the program or the machine has to identify which one to pick next. So we started with stack and buffer and we know that initially it, it would be shift to begin things with. But for the subsequent steps, how does the machine know whether to go with left arc or right arc? So that's where the machine learning comes in. Um, so this, uh, we will get to the part where we discuss how machine learning makes that, uh, make the selection of action or the next action easier. So we have uh, another, in this slide, what we see here is that uh, in the, th this discusses the conventional feature representation. We are familiar with this, where initially before using uh, something like word to vec we had, we had word embeddings which are very sparse, something embeddings which are not really that good. And then we move to the presentation using uh, word to x So to evaluate uh, the dependency parsing, for example, given a sentence, she saw the video lecture, how do we know that the parser has, uh, this again is, is more like how the, how ML, we have label data, which give us the correct label. We'll have the predicted labels, and then we are simply going to compare these two and how good the parser has done. So on the left here, what we see is uh, this, this box contains the actual or the right dependencies. There are two things here. One is we can see uh, the, all these words are indexed so that it makes it easier for us to interpret uh, or visualize how these dependencies go go about. So we see that uh, we the words she and saw. There is some there there is uh, there's a curve here for these two words, and the relation between those two is subject. So she the word she is the subject here for the word saw. So that's what this this conveys. So on the extreme end of this this box, we have these uh, word uh, categories like subject, root, determinant, and then an object. And what we have here on the left side is how, which word is dependent on which other word. So that's what we have here. The right side box, we have uh, 
the parse let's say you have used some parsing algorithm and these are the results that we, we and now to to evaluate the dependency parsing we can simply go with accuracy like correct dependency number of dependencies that is one way of doing it and then we also have something called uas which is unlabeled score and label score so when it comes to unlabeled score, what we're going to see is you're not going to consider these graph here and subject root. You're completely going to ignore this. You're instead only going to focus on whether the dependency plots are accurately done or not. So just uh, focus on the numbers here. So we have one, two here, which means there is uh, some sort of dependencies between the words one and two. And the parsed or the predicted result also has one and two, which means it got the is right in the in, in the, but here in the in the third example we see that for the words the and uh, for the words three and. three and four so which is not right so which is why for the unlabeled score we get 80 percent we only get 80 percent accuracy so that's one way of measuring the accuracy and then we have something called labeled uh, score in which just just give me a minute please Uh, yeah, uh, what we're going to compare is we're going to compare the predicted categories, actual categories. Uh, and uh, we have here root debt. Whereas here we see that for four and five, I'm wrong, which is why the accuracy here is not that good as compared to you. So these are some of the metrics that can be used for evaluating uh, dependency parsing. So why train a neural dependency parser? Why, why do we have uh, to use this? So there are three problems here. Uh, they are missing. In, uh, so what we have there and this okay um Yeah, so there are some problems uh, with the conventional dependency parsers which are addressed by neural. One is we saw that in, in the conventional uh, approach, we have sparse representations, whereas with neural ones, we have a distributed dimensions, which makes things easier. And um, so that's one of them. So a neural dependency parser, this is a paper which was, uh, this, is, this is some work which was done by Chen and Manning. Manning is the course instructor for CS220 uh, for, for this course. So they have come up with this work, a neural dependency parser, uh, which as we can see here, so the thing that we notice here is that uh, we have different parsers here. The C is not only giving uh, good results like for unlabeled score we and for label score we have 89 which is comparatively better than all of them. but the important thing is this which is 654 so this is this is the time it is taking uh, it, this is number of sentence parts per second which is maximum when compared to the other parcel so we can see here that the cm cnm 2014 they reproach than the previous parsers. 
So we, we have seen in the previous lectures how uh, the distributed representations of word to vec has made, uh, has made uh, a lot of things easier. So the same thing uh, is with uh, dependency graph dependency as well. So instead of using uh, sparse representation, we can go with distributed representations. And uh, where we can see here that similar words are being clubbed together, was, were, is. So good is a, totally, is a word which is from a totally different class, which is why uh, we, we can see here that uh, it, is, it is at a different, uh, it comes in a different region in, in the vector, spa vector space, sorry. And then we have uh, another words here, come, go, uh, which are verbs. So we can see that using distributed representations, we have, uh, we have the repair semantically separated from uh, among. So this, uh, what we see here is that uh, these are some, some representation for, for getting the distributed uh, representations all of put together to form uh, the representations of uh, the cat we so these things are converted to vector embeddings so this, this this is a typical neural network architecture we have in the beginning and then we have a hidden layer and then we have a simple softmax or so this is the model architecture uh, for this so dependency parsing for sentence structure. Yeah, so as proposed, the transition-based neural dependency parsing uh, has outperformed the traditional or the conventional approaches. That's because these neural networks are bigger and they are, uh, we can see that we, we know that the neural networks today are uh, much deeper and bigger than uh, how they used to be. And uh, so another thing here is that uh, beam search is also used. So what the neural net, the, the way the neural network works in this case is that uh, we have seen earlier where the, the, uh, the model has to choose between what step it has to perform next. Is it shift or is it left arc or is it right arc? Now the model might come up with uh, one action always be right, which is why at every state we need some sort of hypothesis which says that, okay, these are the possible two steps that could happen. That can be done uh, using beam search. So these are all, uh, these are all the things that were discussed in the five. I have another uh, blog that I would like to go through quickly. I'll share the screen for that. I hope you're all able to see a uh, Google AI blog now. So this, uh, this is a blog on SyntaxNet, which is, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, which is a parser. So this is one example here, Alice saw Bob. Alice is a noun, saw is a verb, and Bob is a noun again. So here we are going to take saw as the root. Alice is going to be the subject of it, and Bob is going to be its object. So this is one way of parsing a sentence. In this case, it's a very simple sentence and we got it right, even uh, a parser would get it right. And uh, now here is another example. Alice, who had been reading about SyntaxNet, saw Bob all the way yesterday. So this is a much bigger sentence and a more complex sentence. So, so what ha what's happening here is that uh, as explained here, yeah, this is the example. So why is parsing so hard for computers to get right? So we're all able to see this clearly. We have this example. 
um, Alice, who had been reading about, uh, yeah, Alice drove down the street in her car. This, and it's it's the same sentence again here. But we can see that the dependency, uh, the parser has different sort of uh, tagging for both. Uh, for the same sentence, we have multiple possibilities. Here, just f uh, let's focus on the word in, which is a preposition. Here, in the first case on the left, we see that the word in has a dependency with the word drove, which is a verb. So these two are linked here, drove and in. Whereas on the right, what we have is the word in has a dependency with the word street, which is a noun. So how, about, how is that going to change things? So the first, in the first sentence, we see that Alice drove down the street in her car, which means that Alice is driving and she has driven down, down the street. So she's in the car and she has gone down the street. That's how it, that, that's what it means. Now, the sentence on the right depend, uh, based on the way it's tagged or structured, it means that Alice has, had, Alice has driven down the street and the street is here. here it conveys that the street is actually in her car. So this is one example of uh, the way the are structured makes a lot of difference. Here we have another stack and buffer thing that we discussed using the same three uh, shift, left arc, and right arc. So this is an example, and uh, yeah, so th this is all that was described. I'll go to the chat window now to see if there are any questions. So if anyone wants to add anything or ask any questions, uh, I think we can do that now. So there is a question, a part of the problem is these are all headlines of newspaper articles and they do not follow all the rules of English, true. Uh, yes, so the problem is not just with the headlines of newspaper articles. So when we are dealing with text, they could be from a website in which the author is someone who has written a very, uh, who, who has a very well written article that follows all the grammar. Whereas it could be just another web page, uh, which is full of text, but doesn't follow all the grammar. So I think the problem, the problem is, uh, we will be seeing just with uh, headlines of newspaper articles, but everywhere uh, language. So think about, think about it this way. So be a part of speech tagger or uh, for any other, uh, sentence structuring and uh, dependent something which is the core part of natural language understanding. So which means for every action that uses language, like it could be, uh, it could be for chatbots or it could be thing or it could be for any of such examples, I think, uh, so it becomes critical there. Do we have any other questions? Hello. Hello. Yeah, Gautam. I uh, I just had a general question. So I have a yeah. problem in my workplace. So it's regarding uh, uh, like uh, deriving triplets from sentences. So do you think this dependency graph would help in that? So suppose you have a sentence like uh, Sundar Pichai resigned as the CEO of Google, and I want to uh, derive. I mean, extract the uh, like Sundar Pichai 
and then resigned and then google these three things i want to extract from a sentence so given any sent given a paragraph i should be able to extract a triplet uh, from that paragraph it could be so i have a set of relations which i am interested in like resigned or joined as director something like that so do you think a dependency graph would help in that uh i think what you're uh, asking about is more of an entity recognition if i'm not wrong it's not just entity so i have to extract uh, and it there will be a subject there will be an object and mm -hmm. there will be a relation which uh, connects them okay like sundar pichai resigned and google so sundar pichai and google are entities whereas resigned is a relation that connects them so i was i, was, I mean this was a problem that i'm facing and i'm i was thinking of using dependency graphs for this so okay. if you know something about it e, yeah yes i think i remember reading somewhere here in in the same blog itself uh let me see if i can find it yeah so Here it says that uh, the grammatical relationships encoded in dependency structures allow us to easily recover the answers. Like we have uh, here, Alice had been reading about syntax with something. So now, whom did Alice see? Who saw Bob? So these these kind of uh, can be answered using these sort of dependency structures. So I think yes, I think it must be possible. Uh, to extract that kind of information using dependency structures though i haven't worked, but i think maybe that's possible okay uh, yeah i'll check out this blog yep thanks yeah i i'll be sharing this uh, in the channel okay yep thank you no problem so we have another question so why is uh, why is the root pointing pointing to saw not to alice yeah so so in some of the examples the root was chosen as um, i think most of the time the main verb is the root verb, right main verb is the root yeah even in the examples that we saw look was the root so even the other examples it's like the root is often picked as uh, the verb so maybe it's that's the that's one of the reasons but uh, i i'm not sure exactly why that is like why verb always yeah i guess most of the time the main verb in the sentence is the root yeah. yeah and maybe that's because and you have in this example let's say we have alice and bob and saw is some sort of dependency with both the words so maybe that has to be the reason like the main verb of the sentence of has some sort of link or connection with with the other so maybe that's why it, it gets picked as the root probably because of the tree structure because otherwise you won't be able to maintain tree structure right was there any question or did did anyone say something hi so i was saying uh, it's probably because uh, that's the only way you can maintain the tree structure yes yeah that's true otherwise you won't you will lose the tree structure you'll have backwards and complex yeah that makes sense yeah
so if there are no other thing uh, we are done with today's study study group we're going to be on uh, recurrent neural networks i think from here on we're going to have more neural network stuff which so we also have assignment 3 uh can take that up in one of the upcoming weeks so meanwhile if anyone wants to uh present any of the upcoming sessions or it it may not necessarily be related uh to directly to the lectures if you if you find any topic that is relevant to nlp and you you would like to discuss about it please feel free to let us know so that uh, we can plan accordingly So yeah uh, thank you all for joining uh, see you all next week happy weekend